Let's pass the peace, as is our tradition, so that we reconcile ourselves one to the other. And uh, how we do that is we can turn to one another, peace be with you, my peace be with you, or peace be with you. And then when we've, when we've kind of done that, then you turn to me and I say, peace be with you all, and you say to me, all right, so let us begin with our peace. Peace be with you. You may be seated. I am Reverend Brenda Tory, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I want to tell you that your presence here today changes things. It changes the world by the act of inviting God into your heart and into your thoughts, and then back out into your community. And we all say, Amen. I'm just going to let you know that uh, I'm not quite sure what I was doing with the readings this week, but the text that you're going to see for Philippians is not going to be the correct text. So Steve, don't put up the slide for Philippians 1, 21 to 30. It is actually the text that um, Bob is going to read for us this morning. So you're just going to have to do a really good job of listening. And that was my error. Are you ready for your call to worship? All right. No special qualifications needed, no particular connections or exclusive memberships required, no secret passwords or unique attributes expected. Just an amazing invitation to a feast to find our place at your table. Alongside These, other humble, these others humble enough to accept the invitation without asking, who else will be there? And let us stand for the singing of Come, O Fount of Every Blessing, Voices United 559. Dreams 
We're going to bless our harvest on this Harvest Sunday and World Food Sunday, as it is. And I will begin, and then you will uh, join in. <clears throat> For all your good gifts safely harvested and gathered in gluts of fruits and vegetables, abundance overflowing, for giving away and cooking and sharing. May we for all your good gifts stored for the cold, harsh winter months ahead, where the ground lies dormant and nature takes her rest for freezing and preserving and jam making. For all your good gifts for planting and nurturing and harvesting in different habitats and climates around the world, for stories of sowers and swords turned to hoes, for bread, broken and wine shared. May we share our story and our stories as a blessing to us. You may be seated. Okay. Our first reading this morning is from Isaiah 25, verses 1 to 10, from the message. God's hand rests on this mountain. God, you are my God. I celebrate you. I praise you. You've done your share of miracle work, wonders, well thought out plans, solid and sure. Here you've reduced the city to rubble, the strong city to a pile of stones. The enemy big city is a non-city, never to be a city again. Superpowers will see it and honor you. Brutal oppressors bow in worshipful reverence. They'll see that you take care of the poor, that you take care of poor people in trouble, provide a warm, dry place in bad weather, provide a cool place when it's hot. Brutal oppressors are like a winter blizzard, the vicious foreigners like high noon in the desert. But you, shelter from the storm and shade from the sun, shut the mouths of the big mouth bullies. But here on this mountain, God of the angels' armies will throw a feast for all the people of the world, a feast of the finest foods, a feast of vintage wines, a feast of seven courses, a feast lavish with gourmet desserts. And here on this mountain, God will banish the pool of doom hanging over all peoples, the shadow of doom darkening all nations. Yes, 
He'll banish death forever. And God will wipe the tears from every face. He'll remove every sign of disgrace from his people wherever they are. Yes, God says so. Also at that time, people will say, look at what's happened. This is our God. We waited for him and he showed up and saved us. This God, the one we waited for. Let's celebrate, sing the joys of his salvation. God's hands rest on this mountain. And our second reading is from Philippians 4, verses 1 to 9 from the Common English Bible. Stand firm in the Lord. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and miss, who are my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord. Loved ones, I urge you, Rhodia and Sintashi, to come to an agreement in the Lord. Yes, and I'm also asking you, loyal friend, to help these women who have struggled together with me in the ministry of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the scroll of life. Be glad in the Lord always. Again, I say, be glad. Let your gentleness show in your treatment of all people. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all your requests to God in your prayers and petitions, along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Jesus Christ. From now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent and if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things. All that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. Practice these things. Whatever you learned, received, heard, or saw in us, the God of peace be with, will be with you. A reading from the Gospel, Matthew 22, 1 through 14. This is the parable of the wedding. Jesus responded by speaking again in parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding party for his son. He sent his servants to call those invited to the wedding party, but they didn't want to come. Again, he sent other servants and said to them, tell those who have been invited, look, the meal is all prepared. I've butchered the oxen and the fattened calf. Now everything's ready. Come to the wedding party. But they paid no attention and went away, some to their fields, others to their businesses. The rest of them grabbed his servants, abused them, and killed them. The king was angry. He sent his soldiers to destroy those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his servants, the wedding party is prepared, but those who were invited weren't worthy. Therefore, go to the roads on the edge of town and invite everyone you find to the wedding party. Then those servants went to the roads and gathered everyone they found, both evil and good. The wedding party was full of guests. Now when the king came in and saw the guests, he spotted a man who wasn't wearing wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? But the man was speechless. Then the king said to his servants, tie his hands and feet and throw him out into the farthest darkness. People there will be weeping and grinding their teeth. Many people are invited, but few are chosen. Herein lies wisdom. And we say, and now we're going to listen to a reading um, because we do have some little ones online this morning. So we're going to lead, listen to a reading from Max Lucado of All You'll Ever Need. All You Ever Need by Max Lucado and illustrated by Douglas Klauber. Years ago, there was a village in a desert land. In this dry land, there was very little water. It seldom rained, 
that when it did, the people scurried about, capturing what they could in buckets and pots. Every drop was like purest gold. But even though the land was dry, the people were never thirsty. For nearby lived a kind man named Tobias, who owned a deep wellspring from which poured clear, cool water. The people called Tobias the water master, and they loved him very much. He shared his treasure with everyone in the village. All they had to do was ask, and the water master would gladly let them dip into his well. Drink all you want, he offered. Not only did Tobias share from his well, but he taught his son to do this also. Tobias and his son, Julian, would help the people dip their buckets and carry their loads. Day after day, the people would come to the well. Tobias would smile and say, take all you need. He would talk to the people about their lives. He would laugh with them and inquire about their hopes and dreams, while Julian helped them draw water for their families. Tobias was a kind friend, always ready to help the villagers. One day, the water master announced to the village, My son and I are going away for a while. While we're gone, my servant Elzevir will watch over the well. He will give you all the water you need. With that, the water master and his son turned and walked up the road leading from the village. The people were sad to see them leave, but they trusted Elzevir to supply their needs. And indeed, Elzevir did just as the water master said. Each day when the villagers came to ask for water, he eagerly filled their buckets. As he did, he told the people, take all you need. There is plenty of water for all. For a time, the village went about its business, as usual. But then one day, Elzevir noticed that the villagers were not grateful when they received their water. They just took their full buckets and raced away without one word of thanks. This troubled Elzevir so much that he decided to stop giving water to everyone. He forgot the water master's kindness to all. Instead, he announced to the villagers, from now on, I will not give water to those who aren't thankful. The people were surprised. After Elzevir's announcement, all the villagers tried hard to remember to thank him when they received the water. Sometime later, Elzevir noticed that some of the people were unkind to their neighbours and mean to their animals. Again, the substitute watermaster was bothered. He determined to give water only to nice people. If you are mean to your animals or unkind to your neighbours, you will get no water, he announced. The people worked hard to please Elzevir so they wouldn't go thirsty. But as time passed, the taskmaster continued to find some new fault with the people. You are too busy. You are too lazy. You are not quick enough or smart enough or pretty enough. With each decision, fewer people were given water. Over time, the villagers grew sad and angry. How can we ever be good enough for Elzevir? They questioned. We'll all die of thirst, they cried. As Elzevir's rules grew longer, the line for water grew shorter. The people growing thirsty began to give up. It's no use, the people cried. We can't please you. In the midst of the shouting, a quiet figure approached the gathered villagers. Elzevir eyed the man suspiciously. Another thirsty soul, no doubt, he growled. Can you show that you are worthy of this water? The man quietly strode to the well and turned to the people. I have come to help you, he said. Elzevir was angry. Just who do you think you are? The man removed his cloak. And the villagers gasped. When they saw the familiar face, they began to whisper among themselves. I am Julian, the son of the water master. My father sent me to share the water with all the people. 
and at that the people cheered. Elzevir became afraid, and the villagers wanted revenge. No, what for Elzevir? they shouted. The sun held up his hand to the crowd to quiet them. My father's water is a gift to all, he said patiently. But Elzevir was cruel to us. I know he was, but if water were given only to good people, who could drink? No one spoke. The son placed his hand on Elzevir's shoulder. Freely you have received, freely give. The people looked at each other and were silent. They knew the son's words were wise and true. And so, from that day on, Elzevir was forgiven, and the water was shared freely. Amen. Amen. Let us rise and sing together Voices United number 205 like the mur murmur of the dove's song. So feasting this morning features in two of our readings. And of course, our book that we read this morning, All You'll Ever Need, illustrates God's capacity for mercy and forgiveness and generosity. The Philippians reading pivots us toward an environment of peacemaking and general good Christian practices of living. And on this World Food Sunday, we continue in a time of thanksgiving. Last week, we celebrated the national holiday of thanksgiving with the celebration of Holy Communion and afterward gathered for a breakfast feast. And this morning, we look outward as we offer bounty from our abundance to the wayside community, particularly to the Bridgeport Cafe. Now, some of us may be familiar with the cornucopia, the horn of plenty with the produce and the flowers of all kinds and colors, fruit of many descriptions and corn spilling from the mouth of the horn. This morning, we are creating a cornucopia in real life, not a still life image. And that may be where these readings are leading us. Christian faith does not require only times of quiet contemplation. Oh, 
going back. Christian faith does require times of quiet contemplation so that we can sift God's words from all of the noise that comes at us in a day. Even here, we practice some guided meditations. So quiet listening is important. Jesus preached. People listened. And some of us might nod when we connect with a truism we hear from the pulpit. And some of us might doodle while we listen. And that is how we quiet our minds to listen. But as we can see in this harvest this morning, only admiring a still life of a cornucopia isn't going to feed anyone. We can admire it, the painting. It still won't feed us. Living a still life isn't what Jesus is calling us into. Now, a few months back, Loris, a member of this congregation, and I enjoyed a very brief discussion on the meaning of the parables. It was after I preached on some of these parables and had attempted to explain how a parable works. And Laura sent me this little quote, which she learned in Sunday school. A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Shall I say that again? A parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And I thank you for this, Loris, because I think it helps. So as we read the parable of the wedding invitation, where is God in this parable? If we look to Max Lucado's book, All You'll Ever Need, an interp- that's an interpretation of God's mercy and goodness toward us, the king in the parable does not seem very godlike. Throughout the previous chapter in Matthew, chapter 21, we find Jesus hounded by the chief priests, the legal experts, and the elders of the people. As an example, I'll read to you the parable of the two sons that comes in chapter 21. Jesus said to them, What do you think? A man had two sons. Now he came to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. No, I don't want to. I'm sure none of us have heard that from our children. No, I don't want to, he replied. But later he changed his mind and went. The father said the same thing to the other son, who replied, Yes, sir. But he didn't go. Which one of these two did his father's will? And they said, The first one. And Jesus said to them, I assure you that tax collectors and prostitutes are entering God's kingdom ahead of you. For John came to you on the righteous road, and you didn't believe him. But tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. Yet even after you saw this, you didn't change your hearts and lives, and you didn't believe him. This parable is directed at those who were hounding Jesus. This harassment began after Jesus entered Jerusalem on the donkey and proceeded in a great spittle, producing rage to throw out the buyers and the sellers of trinkets and overturn tables of dove sellers and money changers in the great temple. Jesus restored it to a place of hope. He sat and proceeded to heal people, turning their lives around, those blind and those lame. Heads turned. The higher-ups took notice. This was not still life Jesus. This was Jesus throwing out the things that defiled his father's house. This was Jesus offering a full life for those whose lives had been stilled by illness, disease, and poverty. As I know many of you here in the pews and on Zoom this morning, I know you are not still lifers. You are here and have been active uh, participants in the life of this community. 
So where then is the invitation for us in our readings this morning? I think it is in these little moments, and I'll tell you one of mine. I am aggrieved to say that someone from our wayside community left with an item this week that I thought they may not understand the value of. And when I gave them some indication of my discomfort, they explained to me why this was the perfect item for them. And it was. I was making a judgment. Much like Elsevier and all you'll ever need and the chief priests and the legal experts and the elders of the people in the Matthew reading, I thought the item was mine to give or not to give. And it never was. It was never mine to give. The chief priests, the legal experts, and the elders of the people were squandering God's invitation to live, as Paul calls to us. From now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent and if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things, all that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. Jesus opened the temple for its rightful purpose. He healed and he cared for, never squandered and never withheld. Consider the cost of his ultimate gift. Last Thanksgiving weekend, while Mike and I carted things off between the apartment and our new to us storage unit, we counted off our blessings. It was a good thing to do, that little practice. Greed still stole its way into my heart for a moment later that week, but I quickly saw, I quickly saw it for what it was and asked forgiveness. The person who needed that item showed me the way of my error. God leading both of us. Do I hear an amen? Leslie just left us. Amen. Amen. It's these little moments that steal the opportunity for real life work from us. Snippets of jealousy, entitlement, If we are counting whatever blessings we do have, we can live with the hope the writer Isaiah offers. And God will wipe the tears from every face. He'll remove every sign of disgrace from his people wherever they are. Yes, God says so. So there, this is where we as Christians live in real life shuffling alongside our brother Jesus, one foot in front of the other. The rules are simple. The work is tricky. The work is tricky that we have been invited to do. To close, I thought this video from the work of the people bridges the themes of abundance and blessing that we are discussing this morning and I hope it blesses you with understanding. My soul is for your blessing, for you are very great. Clothed with light and splendor, wrapped in light like a garment, who stretches out the sky like a curtain, whose roof beams are fashioned with the waters, whose chariots are the clouds, 
who walks along the wind's wings, whose messengers are the winds, whose ministers are fire's flames, who sets the earth upon her foundations so that she cannot be moved, and covers her with waters like a robe, the waters stood high above the mountains, and with your blast they fled. Hearing your thunder, they rushed away, ascending the mountains, pouring into the valleys, until they found the place you'd set aside for them, holding them within their borders they not return to engulf the earth, who makes springs gush forth from the hills, so that between the hills brooks run clear, giving drink to the roaming animals. There the deer come to slake their thirst, there the waterfowl nest, sending out their voices from between the nearby branches. You water the mountains from your lofts, satisfy the earth with the fruits of your labor, cause grasses to grow for the cattle and herbs to respond to a human touch, so that people can bring forth crops from the land and wine to gladden their hearts, and oil to make their faces glisten, and bread to sustain them. cedars of Lebanon that you have planted, where the birds make their nests. The heron has her home in the junipers. The high mountains are for wild goats, the cliffs a shelter for marmots. You made the moon for the seasons, made the sun that knows when to set darkness to ripen into night, so that the night animals feel moved to stir, the young lions to roar for their prey, asking you for their food, and when the sun comes up they return quietly home, to crouch asleep in their dens, then people go out to do their work and they labor until evening. How various are these deeds that you have performed so shapely. The earth so full of your riches. Here is the vast, wide sea in which creatures without number of all sizes and kinds crawl and swim or drift and wave there the great ships make their voyages, and huge whales journey and breach without tiring. All these wait upon you to give them their food in due season. What you give, they gather. You open your hand and they are satisfied. Hide your face and they vanish. Remove your breath and they perish. Return to the dust they were made from. Breathe again your breath and they enter life renewed. Refreshing the face of the earth. Your glory endures forever. Your work is an endless rejoicing. You who glance at the earth and she trembles, who touch the mountains and they smoke. While I live, my songs will be for you. While I am, I'll speak my gratefulness. May my words be agreeable. Yes, I will share your rejoicing. 
May all that denies you be denied, and all that demeans you pass. My soul is for your blessing. I praise that too. And we all say, thanks be to God. If you want to rise for uh, the message hymn, Teach Me God to Wonder. And that's Voices United 299. And we'll sing Let's verses sing. 1, 2, and 3. <laughs> I have here for us a little Thanksgiving prayer. God, you are big hearted with no limitation. You overgive and overpay, handing us not only the rewards due us, but heaping on us the fortunes of everlasting life and love. We thank you that heaven is not just like our earth, that grace does not abide by our rules. We are grateful that our little ways open out when we listen to you. Lavage your spirit of kindness upon us. Help us give and never count the cost. And we say, Amen. You may remain seated, unless you feel you can't sing, unless you're standing, to uh, sing Voices United 545, You Nourish Us.
Now let us move into a time of prayer. Please take a moment of silence to hold these people and those people that you know needing our prayer. we begin from Psalm 103 he does not treat us as our sins deserve we celebrate your absolute and complete unfairness God you do not give us what we deserve you answer our unfaithfulness with generosity you do not repay betrayal with vengeance you never stop loving when we give every reason for you to stop you give us every possible chance and then still more to start again. But our story doesn't end there. You invite us into the life of faith where your impossible grace becomes the standard for our living. As such, we pray for your company as we try the things we fear we can't do. In the silence, we name the people it is impossible for us to forgive and ask you to walk with us in the journey of grace. We know we name the people we know we have no right to ask forgiveness of and ask you to walk alongside them with your compassion. We name the situations that have no resolution that we can possibly imagine and pray that will not stop us from always choosing love. Your ending is always and only love. May we live to make that the world's ending too. So now let us pray together in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Mother and Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now we come to our time of offering. I dwell upon the goodness in my life. Thank you. I cherish in my heart your gift to me. Thank you. I notice the blessings of life, breath, loving and sharing. I am so very grateful and I respond to your love with this gift today. In loving partnership we come seeking O God your will thanksgiving we sing a song of thanksgiving today dear god one and many we pause in the midst of all that is unholy unthinkable 
and undeniable to look within and offer our gratitudes for a day that has dawned anew and for the breath that life gives us. We celebrate the abundance in our lives and that we can share it with the world. In jubilance and grace, we offer ourselves and all that we are and have to be your justice and your peace in the midst of all that is unholy, unthinkable, and undeniable. And in the name of Jesus, we say, Amen. Our closing music, our closing hymn is Voices United 556. Would you bless our home and families? your benediction. May the blessing of the God who cycles the seasons and swells the grain go with us. May the blessing of the Son who harvests and kneads bread and, and breaks the bread with us go with us. May the blessing of the Spirit who challenges us to just sharing of earth's harvest go with us now and into the week ahead. We all sing. <laughs>